or we're gonna resume our uh, workshop. Um, thank you very much for that dynamic dis discussion early this morning. Um, it was so wonderful. So let's keep going. Um, so in this afternoon, we have uh, the start with the two sessions. The first one is the session for People's Republic of China, uh, moderated by Ling Li, also Wei Wan. And this is a special virtual session. And the next one will be a uh, session for the, the, the Republic of Korea, uh, moderated by Sujun Zhang. So um, Ling Li, also Wei Wan, I I you ready? Yes. Wei? Sorry, Wei, thank you. Take it away. Sorry, Wei. <laughs> Uh, Wei is going to chair this session. Thank you, Professor Lee <laughs> and Tom. Uh, Thanks, good Wei. afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I do miss the Asian delicious food in Singapore, and I hope I can have a bite, <laughs> maybe for the next opportunity for in-person meeting. Uh, I'm Wei Wan from Clean Asia. Uh, I was more than glad to join the organization committee and gather this China session together with Professor Li Ling from uh, Westlake University. I got to know Jam uh, since I have been working with Clean Asia and also a Peking University team to um, implement the regional exchange activities and support the uh, regional co collaborative research program. I think it is very important that Chinese researchers and policy makers and other stakeholders could have this kind of uh, platform or constant tube to share our progress and learn from each other, exchange uh, the latest information and key findings from research and also explore opportunities for synergies. Uh, China is the world's most populous country and Asia's greatest or largest economy. The improvement of air quality and reduction of greenhouse gas emission will benefit not only China itself, but also the region and the world. Over the last decade, China's economic de development, uh, I think, gradually aided, shifted uh, from an incentive, intensive development to greener pathways making very uh, positive progress in air quality management and climate change mitigation. An example is that we did not have PM 2.5 monitored or data reported timely to the public 10 years ago. Uh, I need to collect PM 10 concentration data annually from the China annual bulletin for WHO's air quality database at that time. The leapfrog development happened in 2013, the year since the country revised the ambient air quality standards uh, in 2012 and also announced national action plan for cleaner air. Now there are more than 1,700 monitoring stations across the country operated by national level and also a big number at city level, I believe. Um, there are more than there were more than 300 stations were newly added to the network in the last year. It will keep expanding. Uh, in 2020, the country uh, also announced its goal of achieving carbon peak and carbon neutrality, uh, bringing the momentum to the control and core benefits of greenhouse and gr air pollutants emission abatement and reduction. There were 13 cities were also selected as pilots to have the uh, greenhouse gas monitored, which also become a new priority currently to meet the gap of uh, greenhouse gas monitoring system is that establishment. And the last decades was also called the golden 10 years of China's ecology protection. We also made remarkable progress uh, in that area. During the China session, we will have five presentations to give technical uh, policy perspective and also science perspective and highlights on the mentioned uh, areas and topics, including the ecosystem, air and greenhouse gas. Uh, what we monitor, how we use the data to support the assessment and make science-based policies in China. 10 minutes per speakers will be provided uh, for the presentations and also we will leave 10 minutes for interactive discussion and Q&A session. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Thomas Wenger, uh, who is from the Westlake University. Uh, He's, the, he's an associate professor at Westlake University and leads the Sustainable Agriculture System and Engineering Lab. His expertise and 
research interest mainly focus on the sustainable agriculture, I believe. Uh, and you already have the bias of all speakers. I prefer not repeating the details and save some time for the valuable talk. Uh, Dr. Wenger, over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, way for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, Wei Wen, I hope you can you can hear me now. Um, I will be talking about uh, embedded systems monitoring primarily in agricultural landscapes and give a global network perspective, of course, with a focus on China and then also the work that we are doing um, on other continents. So, so um, just to briefly introduce you to some of the issues that current agricultural systems are challenging uh, facing. So we are now feeding 7.5 billion people, but by 2050, this number will increase to 10 billion people and that requires about 50% more food. And also very likely, if we continue as we do now, we will expand the area that is needed for this agricultural production. Climate change was a big topic. Agriculture is responsible for one quarter of all greenhouse gas emission currently. So we need to reduce that number despite further in, uh, required food. And then uh, there's also significant pressure on biodiversity that provides valuable ecosystem services uh, for sustainable agriculture production. So a number of solutions have been proposed um, and they are focusing on nutrish, nutritious diets that reduce uh, red meat, for instance. But we also see uh, nature-based solutions uh, that are coming up. I want to talk more about uh, diversification uh, in the future in, in this talk. Uh, we also see more solutions focused on the choices of protein sources, for example, of the consumers and the opportunities for digitalization in agriculture. In this talk, I want to focus on the solutions that we're working on. So first, agricultural diversification across multiple spatial scales, then uh, talk about collaborative platforms, our global agroforestry network and the China rice network, mention briefly uh, what we're doing in the Hangzhou Bay here in China, and then uh, close with uh, embedded technology to quantify and monitor uh, diversification practices. So diversification, what is that? Let's take a look at a corn soil rotation system. On the left-hand side here, you see a monoculture of, of, uh, of corn. So if we add um, an, a prairie strip, an activorous plant with long roots, by just increasing this functional diversity, we can reduce the runoff, the nutrient loss from the soil by up to 95%. So diversification is really the addition of functional diversity to enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services. So we see here by going from a monoculture to a diversified system, we have increased bee diversity for pollination or we have increased bird diversity for biological pest control. Together with international collaborators in my group, we have been quantifying diversification effects on a global scale. So when you look at the X axis of this graph, you see services from soil fertility to water regulation, biodiversity and pollination. And everything that's green means diversification is good and has positive effects and everything that is red means negative. So we found that on average 70% approximately are positive uh, of these effects and, 20, and, and about one quarter of the effects are neutral. So that's good news. Diversification can really on a global scale across crops help um, sustainable crop production. We also identified trade-offs uh, that if you cannot, uh, when and how you can concomitantly increase crop yields and ecosystem services through diversification. And we identified also a gap on location-based studies and crop-specific effects, for instance, on, on rice production. I want to talk about this more in the remainder of the talk. So let me jump to our collaborative platforms to test diversification effects. So since 2020, um, in my group, we have initiated two larger scale networks to work on applied diversification research. The first is the Global Agroforestry Network where we work on agroforestry systems in cocoa, coffee, and rubber production. And the second network is the China Rice Network. And as the name implies here, we're looking at diversified rice production systems in China. And as you can see, we do this with a number of researchers from different institutions here. 
um, that um, you know make this all possible. I want to just briefly uh, show you some of the projects. So the first project is um, conducted together with the World Resource Institute and the Krauser Lab at ETH Zurich. Here we're using state-of-the-art transfer learning to uh, predict based on our global data sets from the global agroforestry network where coffee and cocoa agroforestry systems have the highest restoration potential to then look into carbon sequestration potential and biodiversity benefits. Of course, uh, these pro kind of projects lend, them lend themselves for you know, collaboration. So this is again, an open invitation here for, for collaborations on, on these large scale projects. In the China Rice Network, we have synthesized uh, 50 years uh, of research on diversification in rice. So this is based on Chinese and English literature. And we find overall that, um, again, that socioeconomic and environmental benefits are uh, found across the board, but we also find high income uh, between country variability, which leads, to, leads us to important management recommendations that can be very spe uh, location specifics. I also want to mention our own monitoring work that we do close to Westlake University um, near Hangzhou, near, uh, close to the Hangzhou Bay. So uh, this area is of particular significance because it is the fastest grow growing economic coastal area in China. And uh, since the onset of coastal reclamation in 2012, there has been a focus on sustainable development in this area. So what we're working on in my group is to quantify plastic pollution mitigation in agricultural landscapes as part of the China Rice Network. But we also have other ongoing initiatives to measure carbon fluxes, for instance, in a gradient from salt marshes to coastal waters. And we work on different microbe effects on, on plant communities. So there's a lot of work ongoing here. And of course, we're also happy to you know, expand that work as part of, of, the, of, the, of the global GMM network. So overall, to sum up this part, uh, for the Global Agroforestry Network and our China Rice Not Network, we have launched six projects together with more than 20 institutions and in more than 10 countries. And uh, I want to reiterate that we're very happy to you know, bring in more people and, and, and work together on, on these diversification issues. Let me come to the last part of the talk that is technology embedded systems to quantify diversification. In my group, we have developed an embedded AI-based camera. Um, embedded in this case means that these uh, cameras have onboard machine learning models running to detect anything that meets the eye, plants, animals, um, but also uh, growing processes of, of different um, crops. They're very low power and by detecting anything that they are supposed to monitor that can also trigger action. So for instance, you have, uh, you could monitor endangered birds and it could send an alert for, for bird watchers to come and, and, and see, see, uh, and, and see these, these birds at specific locations. So we've done some, some case studies, two of which I want to go into more detail here. The first two, this is monitoring of cocoa flowers. Uh, this is for chocolate production, it's ex extremely important. And the second case study I want to talk about uh, biocontrol in rice systems. So when we think of cocoa production, you have little insects that are visiting the flowers that are in, uh, important to produce crop yields. And our previous work has shown that um, we know some something of how to increase these pollinators, but actually we really know fairly little about a multi-billion dollar uh, cropping system. So what we have been doing is deploying these cameras in China and in Brazil to understand uh, the, the um, visitation patterns of, of different species. We have for the first time monitored these patterns over day and night using infrared, infrared light. And so this is quite important for, for the management and the future crop yields that are under substantial threat from climate change. The second example is biocontrol in rice fields. In previous work, we've shown that uh, biocontrol of bats on white-backed plant hoppers, which are the major rice pests, can protect up to 26,000 uh, meals for people per year, equivalent to 1.2 million US dollars a year. And here we're using our cameras at night to effectively detect bats and insects. And we want to roll out this study across China to understand uh, climatic and, and regional differences. So AI-based monitoring devices can basically be used on anything that meets the eye. And with our solar panel, uh, solar board power management systems and IR modules, we can deploy them pretty much anywhere uh, 24 seven. 
I also want to briefly mention our spin-off company um, where we distribute the eConnect system, where we also develop a multi-sensor device that moves purely from computer vision into soil monitoring and um, soundscapes. Uh, and we use this company also to provide educational services to schools now in China, but we're also expanding currently into the United States. So the take home message of this talk is basically that diversification is an effective tool to address the twin challenge of biodiversity conservation and mitigating climate change while supporting the global food systems transformation. I really think that embedded ecosystem monitoring can help us to better understand the regional variability that we're seeing on a larger scale using our networks. And there's, of course, right now, a huge opportunity for multi-sensor devices, not only in research, but also education uh, to sensitize students for, for the environment, which is much more important now than ever. And of course, this is depending on collab collaborations across different sectors. Um, and this is also why I'm extremely grateful that I had the opportunity to present here today. So thanks a lot for uh, attending the talk, for the invitation to present here. Um, I want to acknowledge the work of my team, which makes all of that what I've presented here possible. And I want to point out that as the first private university in China, we're currently hiring for faculty positions, postdocs, PhD positions. So if anybody in the audience is interested in, so, in such opportunities, please feel free to reach out to myself or Professor Ling Li, who's co-hosting this session. And that's all what I wanted to present to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wenger, for sharing the recent studies and your networks and the even working opportunities with us. And the audience is welcome to uh, provide your answers or write your answers to Dr. Wenger through the chatting box. Or we can also save the burning question to the end of the discussion part. And next speakers, uh, let's welcome Dr. Fu Qingyan. Uh, who is also the deputy director of Shanghai Environment Monitoring Center to talk about how air quality monitoring to support the science-based and uh, sophisticated management at city level. Dr. Fu has uh, very strong expertise and rich experience in the air monitoring, modeling, and forecasting. She has been leading the related work and also the PM.5 source for apportionment uh, study, the emission inventory study in Shanghai, and also a key player in the Hangzhou Bay area mentioned by Dr. Wang and as well as the Yangtze River Delta in China. Uh, over to you, please, Dr. Fu. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for your warm introduction. So I, I like to uh, quickly introduce the, our current monitoring system uh, in Shanghai, how to support the an uh, air quality improvement. Uh, so uh, currently you can find out uh, the whole network was studied uh, in last uh, decades uh, from the 1970s that only conventional pollutants include SO2, NO2, as well as acid rain was uh, monitored in, in that period. However, currently the whole system has been developed so quickly that uh, multiple factors have been monitoring, uh, including the superstation. So I will introduce the one by one. And air quality monitoring systems, not only based on the monitoring, but we also help to um, provide the forecasting and the air quality in the coming in one month and uh, uh, three days uh, in accurately. Uh, this can help the public to make the uh, health protection. So the whole monitoring system, forecasting system, as well as the support decision making systems, all these uh, systems were integrated to support the air quality management in Shanghai. The whole monitoring systems not only just the focus on the AQI that we usually call the air quality index, and also we focus on the VOC and other chemical compositions of the PM, as well as the many meteorological factors that the whole, all these factors has been integrated to, uh, to make the source apportionment air quality forecasting, as well as to uh, find out the 
course of the pollution and the emission reduction assessment. So all these systems, the, the key objective is how to uh, make the better um, decision making. This is the AQI monitoring system in Shanghai. We call this is a national control stations. All the total uh, 19 stations were um, evaluated to produce the hourly AQI information to the public. And uh, except for the AQI systems, we developed the special industrial parks air quality monitoring network in Shanghai uh, covering 10 key industry parks. So the uh, characteristics pollutants were monitored, including VOC, ammonia, uh, HO, H2 sulfide, and also other organic sulfides that can help the industries to make the emission reduction. And among these systems, that are three types of monitoring sites, that including the sites inside the industry park, as well as the boundary sites and uh, in the neighborhoods that uh, uh, all these monitoring sites, the total number has been reached at 74. The next uh, network is focused on the traffic pollution. We call the roadside network that uh, we installed the roadside uh, stations under um, focusing on the vehicle emission, but also we and build up another uh, uh, the key stations is focused on the airport and the, the shipping yards. And another uh, most uh, key important network is focusing on the real time and dust pollutions that uh, this is usually used the, the light scattering technique we call this the mini uh, mini stations that all these stations were built up under construct yards, storage yards, and as well as the road sites that uh, and all this uh, um, dust uh, concentration could be um, monitored and uh, um, put, put and, uh, open to the public on the real time, the time resolution is usually second by second. So the public usually can get the minute base information and uh, all this uh, quick real time information can help the local government to help the, the owners of the construction yards to make the, dust, the fugitive dust control immediately. And in order to resolve the and uh, provide the more key impo important information for the composite uh, air pollution, uh, usually we call it ozone and uh, PM 2.5, that we develop in, uh, three super sites in Shanghai. One is in the urban area, one is uh, um, under um, <coughs> upper, upper wing stations is uh, we, uh, on the offshore. And another one is in the location in, in the neighborhoods of the Jiangsu, Zhejiang, and the Shanghai. We call it this superstation could reflect regional pollution. And here, this is a big superstation that we can catch the various parameters on the super size. And except for the uh, networks on the uh, mainland, we, we also start to build up the several stations uh, offshore because that uh, Shanghai is located under a uh, coast of the East Sea. And we usually find out there's the pollution, especially the transported by long distance usually can and the, the pollution will blow under sea and will blow back to the mainland. So this is why we needed to build up the offshore uh, monitoring stations that can give us the, the early warning information. And here, uh, next station, uh, next session is I'd like to show you some examples that we integrated the different uh, stations and so we can make the quick decisions for the um, for the management. For example, we use the super stations that we can identify the, the ozone 
um, the ozone mechanism. So usually we can, can identify this is a BOC control or, or this is the NOx limited. So they can help the government to make the further emission strategy. And we can also use the different uh, chemical um, com compositions of the PM, uh, especially when the pollution uh, has happened and uh, transported from the upwind re regions. So we can use the, the different super stations to, uh, to, um, to catch the, uh, the pollution characteristics and uh, what, what's the key uh, chemical components. This is sulfate or nitrate or the other or other cluster elements. So and use that this data can help you to understand who needed to be uh, cooperated together to make the pollution control. And the, all these data can show you how we, we can use the, this the data together with the vertical meteorological uh, <clears throat> information and also the, the different uh, components and uh, the chemical reactions in the ambient air. And also the in the industry park monitoring, all these uh, characteristics and pollutions can give us the early warning. And then and when we identify the key or the primary uh, VOC components, and we can use this uh, chemical index to identify who is the emitter of the VOC from the specific industry devices. And based on the early warning mechanism that uh, we issued and uh, make this cooperation with the local plants and also the local authority of the management. So use the different level warning systems. We uh, help to decrease the VOC emissions and the pollution in the industry park. You can find out during the past five years, the total number of the uh, uh, warming, the uh, uh, learning, um, Alertly, it has been decreased significantly. So you can find out the average concentration of the VOC has also been decreased. And then another application is we can also use the satellite image and as well as the, the high density mini stations monitoring systems. We can use these data to identify the specific location of the pollution. So also we can use the satellite image to identify the, the, the stock burning sites. So all this information can help the local governments to identify the sources. And we also introduced the, the on vehicle mob, mobile monitoring system to, to block the hot spots on the roads. So all these data um, can, can identify the the specific sources or or the tracks or the the high emitters on the roads, and this is the examples of the real time mini station of the fugitive dust. So you can find out all this is the location of all the thousand the ten the the thousands of the mini stations. All these stators can help you to identify what was the key issues and the key sources of the fugitive dust. And uh, except for the fugitive dust, we can use the, the on vehicle monitoring to to catch the VOC image. So you can find out use the, this the, uh, the mobile systems. You, we can identify the high concentration of the VOC and then to get integrated with the wind direction. And also we can use the, the specific chemical components by the GC, by the mass, the quick mass, uh, the fast mass. And also we can use the UAV, the, the drum, and we can catch at the final em emitters of the VOC concentration. So this is the examples of the offshore monitoring that you can find out when you can uh, get the more information from the seas. So we, we can give the uh, give us the early warning of the pollution. So we, we might reach, uh, get reach the mainland of the Shanghai. So uh, these data and the stations can also help you to identify what, what's the contribution 
um, by the land and the sea breeze. So the the um, high density um, monitoring stations can give you us the, the highest resolution information of the uh, detailed uh, spatial con contribution. So th this is just a general uh, information share here. And we think that uh, during the past uh, decades, uh, with the development of the ambient air monitoring systems, that we can identify the air quality monitoring uh, status as well as to identify the sources of the pollution. So all this, all this information help us to increase the air quality, especially PM 2.5 the concentration reduction in Shanghai. However, um, um, based uh, uh, together with the uh, benefits of the reduction of PM 2.5, that uh, sometimes we can find out the ozone concentration has been decreased. Uh, however, contributed by the, space, uh, by the special high temperature that we find out the ozone pollution become more and more important, especially in this year that with the high, um, Temperatures in Shanghai, the ozone has uh, has been has become the key and the primary pollutants, uh, not only just in Shanghai but also in most uh, uh, mega cities and uh, the region, the high pollution regions in Shang in China, including the Jingjingji, Yangtze River, and the Pearl River Delta areas. So we think that in the future. Um, we need to develop and to increase the capability of the data monitor data analysis, especially the um, the observe the monitoring and the, the observation based modeling should be um, introduced into the systems to make the better uh, decision making. So this is my introduction, and thank you very much. We would like to uh, cooperate. Uh, cooperate with uh, the in, in interesting um, uh, parties and all the researchers here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fu, for your comprehensive introduction. Quickly overview on the uh, advanced system running in Shanghai. And uh, then we will move to the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Yao Bo, who is a professor from uh, Fudan University. His work experience has covered a a wide range of topics, uh, including the greenhouse gas measurement technology and ODS emission estimation and assessment and the policy study. Uh, he's also a very active uh, scientist engaged in many international programs and contributed in WMO and uh, UNAP scientific assessment work of ozone depletion. Uh, over to you, Dr. Yao. Uh, thank you. Wait, uh, so I share my slides. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to uh, join this summit and uh, share our progress uh, in Florida greenhouse gases. This uh, I'm Boyle from Fudan University, and this is actually a joint research program by universities and the industries. Um, so first of all, which is uh, which are Florida greenhouse gases? It might be not familiar to. To quite a lot of us, uh, but it's uh, the flor F gas is actually several groups groups of greenhouse gases, including HFCs, TFCs, SF6, and F3, which regulated by Kyoto Protocol of UNFCCC, as well as uh, HFCs, CFCs, halons, etc., regulated by Montour uh, Protocol. So totally uh, around 60, uh, six, more than 60 compounds uh, of so called fluorinated greenhouse gases. Uh, actually, for in, uh, F gas is a uh, uh, the for, uh, is a key for uh, ozone depletion and the climate change, which are the most uh, uh, which are the two uh, most important uh, global environmental issues. Um, if we uh, look at the climate change, uh, the IPCC AR, uh, AR six showed the uh, um, effective reactive forcing for all of these uh, greenhouse gases and. Uh, F gas is actually contributed to the three important, the third important, following CO, uh, carbon dioxide and methane for climate change. And if we go to the GWP value of this uh, F gas, we could have found that the some of the F gas uh, have a GWP value from more than uh, several thousand to uh, ten thousand. So that's a very strong greenhouse gases. 
And in recent years, uh, we uh, quite a lot of unexpected emissions are reported uh, uh, of uh, F, uh, F gas. Uh, for the, for example, safe, the unexpected emission of uh, CFCs and uh, also uh, for HFCs 23 and uh, some of the very short lived compounds. This could be a damage to uh, a threat to uh, ozone depletion and the climate change. Um, in last year, uh, in, during the uh, ozone manager meeting of the uh, United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, um, the common, uh, there comes to a um, common view is that um, the potential source regions are not sampled. Uh, so if we need to understand better of the, where this um, expected emission comes from, we need to uh, give an expanded uh, sam uh, sampling, sampling network. Uh, here, the footprint of Agage and NOAA system. Um, if we look at this map, we can find that uh, nowadays, um, the F-gas stations, uh, the number of F-gas stations only around 20, which is much, much more, uh, less than uh, greenhouse uh, CO2 and uh, Particles. The the problem is that uh, only state of art instrument uh, are applied. Uh, this instrument are uh, made by a scientific uh, scientist in the labs. So no commercial available instrument before two thousand twenty one is with limited the uh, environment of F gas. The challenge is that the concentration of F gas are ex extremely low at the uh, PPT level. Um, and also uh, high precision are required for such uh, low concentrations. For example, 1% um, is a typical precision required for a compound from the range of one to 10 PPT. So after CFC 11, unexpected emission was found in 2018. Chinese government plan to build a ODS and F gas monitoring and early morning system, which uh, including a F gas uh, observation network. And since there is no commercial available system, so uh, jointly supported by the Ministry of Science and uh, Science and Technology, and uh, as well as Ministry of Environment and Ecology, a key R and D research project was funded to develop a system for high precision ODS and F gas measurement. Such kind of uh, system need to have a similar precision of a, uh, the uh, uh, international state of art system. For example, the Medusa GCMS developed by Agage or the custom made GCMS by NOAA. And this system need to fully aut automation and uh, fully aut automatical data flow. And the core parts need to be Chinese domestic products to shorten the repair time and easy maintenance. Also, this this system needs to be friendly to local technicians. After two years of study, uh, we developed such kind of uh, high precision F gas system. This system follows the principle pre concentration of A gauge Mendoza G cinemas, but the different part is that all these parts are in one frame and we have a separate uh, advanced design of automation, grow, uh, grow cooler and heating unit with building in a grow tiger trap heater and a control PC. The major parts are domestic made and we coding the, uh, all, the, all of the software, uh, ODS control for the uh, automatic control of the system and the uh, ODS data and ODS compare for data process. And this system can mirror observed uh, mo uh, almost all the compounds regulated by uh, uh, F-gas regulated by Kyoto protocol, including uh, 11 HFCs, uh, 6 PFCs, SF6, NF3, and uh, all, uh, all the six groups of, of uh, ODS regulated by Montreal Protocol. Uh, the precision limit is lower than one, 0 0.1 PPT, and the precision is uh, around 1%, which is comparable with uh, Mendoza. We have uh, conducted uh, four month, uh, 14 months of comparison with uh, Mendoza at uh, Shandian's regional background station. Here just shows this difference of these uh, two systems. Generally, 
this the result of the, the two systems uh, uh, agree quite very well with each other. So this system was then applied uh, in uh, different sites uh, in 2021, for example, in uh, uh, background station of uh, Ministry of uh, Envir Environment and, and uh, Ecology, Changdao Station in Northern China, and, uh, uh, and also in, uh, uh, in Shenzhen Station, which is at the shore of uh, South China Sea. So generally, say, uh, we uh, actually the in situ environment sites tripled in uh, this year uh, because this system was developed. Here is what the typical uh, auto, uh, look, um, uh, view of this system inside the lab and the, uh, the outside inlet. Um, for, uh, uh, this system can uh, automatically draw the air from the top of the uh, tower and uh, analysis the samples per uh, 70 uh, minutes. And uh, also our automatic sampling flask module was developed. So if we collect samples from different sites, we can put the uh, flasks inside this module and this system can automatically analysis that. We use the, one, the whole year data, uh, observation data at Shangdian's to uh, research the uh, emission by trace ratio method. Uh, the detail uh, due to the uh, limited time, I do not take talk about the detail of this ma 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 method. Uh, just uh, the C uh, carbon monoxide and the HCFC 22 uh, were used as a tracer. So here is the result. We found the NFC uh, emission from China reached um, two uh, kiloton per year, more than twice of emission of, from China six years ago. And uh, um, actually this is also quite high, uh, higher than the bottom up estimated by Edgar. Uh, also SF6 um, from China continues grew and uh, reached uh, almost four kiloton per year, uh, consistent with the growth rate estimated by inverse modern. Uh, we can see that the uh, uh, actual emission of this compounds is not very high just for several kiloton per year. But if we, if we multiply, multiply by their uh, GWP value of almost 10,000, we can find that CO2 equivalent emission for SF6, SF3, and PFC are exceeding or reaching 100 million tons. So this, um, these three compounds actually contribute significantly to Chinese uh, greenhouse gases inventory. And this slide uh, just shows the emission of uh, six HFCs. We found the uh, uh, expected increase uh, for HFC 32, HFC 134A, and HFC 125, which are the major uh, refrigerant um, used in the recent years. And uh, we also found HFC, uh, the emission of HFC 150, uh, 152A and uh, uh, HFC 134A are much lower than bottom-up inventories. So that means we still need uh, to uh, look, for, look for the uh, uh, source and the banks of these uh, uh, compounds. And uh, for HFC 23, which is a byproduct by HFC 22 uh, emission, there's a still have emission of around 50 kiloton uh, per year in China. So uh, generally speaking, ODS-5 Pro, the, uh, the developed system can provide precise data to estimate national or regional F-gas emission by top-down method. This method is actually uh, recommended by IPCC 2000, uh, 2019 refinement of national greenhouse gas uh, inventory guidelines. And this would use to uh, uh, evaluate it the national uh, greenhouse gas in, uh, gases uh, uh, inventory. Okay, we when we go back to this uh, um, to this map, uh, our work actually provide a tool to expand the F gas network not only in China but also in Asia and the global, and thus could help policymakers or scientists to better understand and resolve the ozone depletion and the climate changes uh, in both regional and uh, global scales. Uh, 
Uh, that's all of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. If you want to talk details of this, you can uh, email me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yao. Uh, and a very nice presentation on the latest findings and also the challenges we have on the monitoring of uh, F gases. And uh, I was reminded that we are uh, behind of our uh, agenda, accounting for the start uh, at uh, 35. So uh, we, will, we need to speed up a little bit. And the next speaker will be Dr. Luca Ding. Uh, he's an associate professor from Peak University, uh, also the deputy director of College of Environmental Science and Engineering, and the State Environmental Protection Key Lab of Atmospheric Ozone Pollution Control. He has been leading several key regional study on the air pollution uh, and with the strong expertise on the uh, atmospheric ozone pollution control. And please, uh, Professor Lu, go ahead to share your screen yeah. and uh, start the talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mrs. Bond. Uh, thanks for your invitation and also by Cohen. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, followed by the previous talk. So my talk focused on, focused on actually a different kinds of the environments, uh, which is oxidants. So humans ex uh, emitted primary pollutants and they are oxidized by oxidants. And this is what I'm talking about. So this is the outline. So first, a few view graphs to warm up. Um, so this is a view graph to uh, display the general concept of the, oh, I guess maybe it's, oh, okay, this is better now. Uh, to show why it is important, oxidant. So humans and also nature emitted gases, SO2, carbon monoxide, VOCs, and NOx. Most of them are redu reductive gases, including uh, Professor Yobo just talked about H HCFCs, and they are transformed, oxidized to be oxidized products, which is gases or formulated particles. And this is our familiar air, urban air pollution, ozone or PM2.5 by secondary organic or inorganic uh, aerosols. So Oxidants is a key part to understand that. And if we expand how the oxidants, actually the oxidants chemistry can be very, very complicated. In the, in the daytime, that is the OH radical chemistry. In the nighttime, that is the NO3 radical chemistry. And in between, we have ozone itself as an oxidant, and also the ozonolysis of alkenes also forms the stable Krige radical. And from our Z, uh, oxidation processes are produced by different passes, which, which are not fully understand. So there is many question marks. And they oxidize the primary pollutants to be different acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and also organic acid, and uh, highly oxidized uh, organic materials. And from nucleation condensation, they become uh, aerosols. So that, that is the general picture about it. So that's why we are interested about that. So it's very critical for the air, bring, air pollution. And also as those, uh, for example, ozone and PM2.5 are important for climate change also. So they are both, it is important to understand both uh, uh, environmental air pollution and also the cl global climate change problems. But itself has itself uh, difficulties. So that is the measurement and modeling of the atmospheric oxidants. And why it is uh, uh, difficult? Because uh, this is on the spatial scale and also on the temporal scale, the oxidants, mostly are radicals, are highly variable and highly re reactive. So they are actually most difficult species to measure in the atmospheric 
uh, species. So it is uh, in the front of our uh, community, but uh, it has also developed in several decades. So I think uh, it is also important that maybe not every site, but uh, in several sites globally or in Asia, we should have that set up to detect the oxidants uh, evolvement or the source and sources and things of those oxidants, which would be very critical, as I just mentioned for uh, environment and climate change. And this is uh, uh, experimental setup which we have achieved in Peking University. We have uh, used a high sensitivity spectroscopy method to set up laser induced fluorescence technology for measure OH radical. And by chemical conversion, we extend that to measure HO2 and RO2 radicals in addition of total OH reactivity and relied on the cavity enhanced absorption spectroscopy method. We have set up the measurement system for NO3 radicals. So with those radical measurement system and in a large group, which we had that uh, in Peking University, we can achieve a closure studies of the atmospheric oxidants. And this is uh, like the picture here that uh, we should set up a superstation for study of atmospheric radical chemistry and to look for radicals and its sources, cyclings and things. And this is also published in a paper which I wrote on National Science Review. So everybody on interest can read that further. And this kind of comprehensive campaign was taking place in Europe, US, and Asia in the past. And in China, we have that also uh, about 10 times. So roughly we have uh, the, by P Peking University, the similar number of that for uh, the other major groups uh, worldwide. But at the moment in China, we focused on urban studies of course for the groups in us and uh, europe they have aircraft campaigns and also forest campaigns which they have different focus so that's the reason why that uh, our single group same sams have done more than all of them on the urban side that is that is the case but they have looked for more uh, places that would be also our target so we are in uh, we, with interest to also perform measurement at uh, different places uh, of the world in Asia and also in China. In China, it's also not enough that we can look for uh, different places. So we have summarized uh, the results from the available data worldwide, which we also include other uh, measurements that is uh, forest and urban areas. and. When we joined that, we found that actually there is a strong missing OH source of classical microzyme for the high VOC and no NOx uh, conditions. And that means the uh, regional, uh, this condition is the regional condition close to mega cities. So all the Asian countries have that uh, similar conditions. And for the last 15 years, uh, including us and also worldwide groups, we Based on that uh, discovery, we found uh, new chemistry discovered. So this missing oil sources is, is linked with the new class of chemistry, which is uh, H-shifted chemistry of organic peroxyl radicals, which we call it uh, RO2 here for the no knock conditions. So in the blue box uh, here, it is a new chemistry. And this new chemistry provides additional hox regeneration, less formation of ozone, but mainly uh, many uh, products of uh, highly functionalized VOCs, which then uh, generate uh, organic aerosols. And in addition to the regional condition, we also found in the urban case, in the high NOx case, there are also missing sources for uh, the perox radicals that is found in uh, US, Europe, and also found now here in China. So there is a strong missing proxal sources. 
And all that new chemistry we found has some common uh, features uh, that is uh, linked to the chemistry of RO2. So we also developed uh, RO2 measurement system like uh, our, our European colleagues that we use chemical conversion to speciate total RO2 short chain alkenes uh, derived R2 and also uh, other R2 from alkenes and aromatics. And with that, we found that uh, actually this R2 chemistry by uh, small uh, alkenes are not a problem. It's uh, from those alkenes, aromatics, and also non-chance derived R2 were strongly underestimated. So that's a problem which we found. Okay, so due to the limited time, uh, I'm uh, summarize the result. So as it is deduced derived here that in the future, it is would be important to establish the direct measurement of speciated R2 concentrations. And that would be a central task for further studies of atmospheric oxidation chemistry for both urban and regional conditions. And here, is a table which listed the potential candidates for fulfill this task, which all are same technique. So chemical ionization mass spectroscopy. And in PKU, we are also de developing one instrument of this kind. At last, I propose that we should have a potential global initiative to uh, enable a joint study of the oxidation chemistry in the troposphere and to include in the different platforms and also to have this uh, uh, database. An analytic database, a composed uh, uh, platforms and also key technology development. Okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu, uh, for sharing about atmospheric oxidants and new chemistry. And I think at the last slide, the ideas about a global initiative will be very uh, interesting proposed to the GM community as well. Hope we can have opportunities to make this kind of synergies. And let's welcome the last but not least important speaker, Dr. Xie Tao. Uh, Xie Tao is an as Assistant Professor from the uh, School of Public Health, Peak University Health Science Center. His works are focused on the environmental risk factors, including the air, the climate change, and their exposure and the health impact and the assessment. And uh, we see the monitoring and data meaning is to provide uh, the uh, to pr provide input to the assessment and support the policies. Uh, Xie Tao, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in the summit. Let, let me share my screen. Okay. Where's my slides? Here. Can you see my slides? Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a great honor to invite me here. So, uh, so I'm Tao from the School of Public Health, Peking University. Uh, as you know, uh, my work is working on the health impacts. So basically, I'm the user of the monitors data. So. Today I'm going to talk about how, how we use it and what we are need to such kind of data. So here's the outline of today's talk. Basically, I will first briefly review the health effect of air pollution and climate change. Then I will talk about uh, why we need a data fusion approach to monitor the air pollution, major air pollution in China. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about uh, what we can get from those data fusion products. Uh, at last, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, climate change related issues. Uh, so basically, here's some background. We know that uh, the air pollution in and outdoor has been uh, identified as the fourth leading cause of dies by the global burden of DD study. Uh, based on the recent studies, it has been linked to eight adverse outcomes. Uh, in the recent studies, uh, the Global burden of study disease have added the uh, neonatal deaths and the diabetes as two 
uh, additional outcomes. Uh, based on this, we know that the air pollution uh, will affect uh, the health of uh, human beings through the whole life course, uh, including the uh, the infant area and uh, the adult uh, and the adulthood. Uh, now let's talk about a little about uh, climate change. For climate change, it's uh, a little bit complicated issues because it is related with multiple exposures and multiple outcomes. Uh, for example, the climate change can affect health uh, through the uh, extreme weather, the cold springs, the, uh, the, the floods, the wildfires, uh, and so on. And uh, even when we look at one exposure, we may find that the outcomes could be very complicated. The right figure shows the, uh, show the different outcomes from the heat and the cold temperature. We can see that it seems that the non-optimal temperature affected uh, different organs of the human beings. Um, now, uh, in our group, we particularly care about uh, the, the landscape, uh, landscape fires, which include the wildfires and agricultural fire, uh, because we know that the fires basically uh, will cause uh, several episodes of air pollution. So uh, they will uh, harm our hu human be uh, health through the air pollution pathways. That's why we are also looking uh, curious to look at the health effect of uh, uh, global fires. Now let's look at the, the uh, air pollution issues in China. Uh, as I think many of us will know that uh, the China has been uh, one of the countries that uh, uh, faced to a uh, serious problems of uh, air pollution. Uh, but uh, because of due to a lot of drivers, China's government decided to control for the air pollution uh, since 2008. For example, some uh, triggers included the, uh, the Beijing Olympic Games uh, in 2008. But during that time, the, the, the high emissions increased by the economics uh, is still uh, still contribute a lot to the air pollution. So the most uh, landmark policies uh, begins from the, to the end of 2012, which means, which is also known as the clean air actions. Uh, during, the, the, uh, during the action, the major and the landmark policy is added the PM2.5, the major air pollution to harm human health into the China's uh, environment criteria. Uh, China, uh, China decided to uh, regulate the PM2.5 since the 2016, and this decision was announced at the end of the 2012, which means from the 2012 and 2016, the China need to build up a national PM2.5 uh, mounting network to, uh, to, to, to for this task. If we want to use this uh, net networks to monitor the health effects from the air pollution, we need to think about the two problems. The first problem is the temporal missingness or the incompleteness in the PM2.5 data. We know that the air pollution has the chronic effects, which means uh, uh, the health outcome from now may be caused by the air pollution exposures in, 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 in long, a few years ago. But we know that we do not have the data before the 2012 due to the, the, uh, the, the data problems. Another problem is the spatial misalignment. Uh, here's a map shows the uh, publishing distribution and the distribution of the monitors uh, established in different years. You can see that by now we can track the uh, air pollution hotspots in most cities, but in some rural and suburban areas, we still do, do not know the data. Uh, to, Deal with the two issues. We uh, came out a method we call it a data fusion approach, which combines the satellite and remote sensing data, uh, the chemical transport models, and the um, ground surface mounting data works uh, using a complicated data uh, data uh, machine learning based method. Uh, the benefit of the method is that it can combine or bring the advantages in different types of data together. For example, based on our experience, we know that the satellite data could be accurate, but it still have some missing problems. For example, if the uh, if the, the land surface covered by the cloud, we will not get the uh, satellite data. Uh, and another type of data is the chemical transport models. Chemical transport models mimic the physical and the chemical process in the atmospheric uh, uh, 
environment. So it can generate the complete uh, spatial temporal continuous data, but it, its result is not accurate uh, because uh, some of the problem, as you know, the, 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 in, the inaccurate errors uh, in the emission uh, inventories. So we develop a, a data fusion products to combine those different types of data together. And uh, those kind of data can also be useful to predict the, 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 the historical constituent data. Because we know that before the year uh, China began to monitor the ground surface air pollution, we, we have already have some satellite data before 2012. We also have the emission data then. So, uh, those data can be used to, to track the historical trend in the air pollution in, in China. So make, make use of that. Actually, we developed two uh, algorithms, one for the PM2.5 and one for older. And uh, uh, together with other labs, we develop this open access data. We call it a TAP, track air pollution data in China. So this data can uh, bring you the near real time uh, air pollution data, it, which include the PM2.5 is, is chemical compositions, the odor concentrations in a high resolutions by each day. Uh, and it has already been used by many institutes. So if you want to look at the health effect or some other uh, quality in China, please to use this kind of data. And uh, actually we use the TAP data to do some assessment. Based on our assessment, the, the China's uh, our quality has uh, PM2.5 quality has been dramatically reduced and it has saved uh, almost uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of life in China. But we know that the WHO has already updated its, uh, uh, its guidelines on the uh, uh, major air pollutants, particularly PM2.5, which has been lowered to the five microgram per cubic meter. Uh, even though China has reduced the PM pollution uh, uh, very uh, rapidly, but to uh, uh, reference to the new WHO guideline, we have a still long way to go. Uh, and and uh, at the end, let me talk about the uh, the landscape fires uh, and uh, or the fires of the PM. We know that the 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 fires of the PM uh, actually it is a it's a component in the data that we have been observed. We have of course we have the uh, PM uh, con uh, concentration monitors which have already uh, tracked the, the, the information of the fires. If the, there's a fire going on, we know that uh, the monitor data will be increased. So, which means we, we, we already have this kind of data, but the problem is how can we separate data from the other sources of PM2.5, uh, which means the monitoring data itself are not uh, be used for that task. That's why we need also to combine those uh, different technology in atmospheric science. And here, the chemical transport model can also help. Actually, it, uh, we can use some scenario analysis. We can shut off the, uh, the, the fire emissions and run and, and scenario without the fire emission. Then we can separate the, uh, the fire source, the PM, from the total concentrations. Use such kind of data, we can uh, study the health impact from the uh, from the fire and the fire source PM, we, we have assessed the, uh, uh, how many uh, children mortalities was attributable to the uh, global fires in the world. And the, in a recent study, we also found that the fire source the PM uh, for per unit is more toxic than the non fire source the PM, uh, which explains why we need to concern about uh, the, 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 the fires and the which it also explains why the climate change can also affect our human health by, through the air pollution pathways. So here is the presentation. Uh, here is the my presentation, and the, as my conclusion, we know that the, the ground surface networks it's alone cannot monitor health effects from air pollution and climate change, particularly in the low and middle income countries where we do not have so many data. So what we wanted is the, some data kind of data fusion approach, in also including the, uh, the AI monitors as mentioned by Dr. Fu Qingyan, Dr. Wangner uh, taught. We should bring all of those kind of data together to monitor our uh, human health. And uh, thanks uh, for my team and for the, the founders. That's it to this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shetao. Uh, very nice presentation on uh, 
the multi sources of data, how we can make good use of this kind of data. Uh, I would like to say thanks a lot to all the speakers for your informative and e excellent talks. Um, sorry for the bad time controlling. There are just so many meaningful and important progress that we can and we would like to share. Uh, I also borrowed three or five minutes from David. Uh, and maybe uh, we can have a uh, Open the floor for a very one or one very quick questions and burning questions that we can discuss at this session. Uh, is there anyone from the meeting room that raised the hand? And I cannot see the hands there, but if we have, so please, David, can bring the question to the speakers. Do we have any? Uh, okay, then I think <laughs> uh, we are good enough. Is anyone passing the microphone? Okay, uh, I yeah, I can see Tom. <laughs> Hello, my question is for the first speaker, uh, which I was very impressed with. I think the uh, agricultural diversification is one geoengineering strategy that may be very effective in not only feeding the world, but reducing greenhouse gases emission and creating uh, greater sinks. But my question has to do with uh, efforts in Silicon Valley to develop uh, di uh, agricultural diversity through uh, synthetic proteins like impossible foods and cell-based uh, meat replacements. I'm wondering how this fits into your perspective on agricultural diversification, if at all. Yeah, thank you for for this for this excellent question. I think we can understand uh, diversification not just as, for instance, adding functional diversity in cocoa plantations through trees, but we can also understand diversification on a genetic level. So we can, you know, include genetically engineered uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas based uh, new varieties. Um, and I think when we can increase the diversity through such measures, we oftentimes also see effects uh, on the soil biota, for example. So I think these um, these these uh, genetically engineered crops certainly play a role um, in terms of um, you know diversifying uh, food intake, diversified protein. I think this is also an important aspect. And I uh, maybe you remember the the pyramid that I showed in the beginning, where changing diets play is actually at the very top of, of what we need to do. So it's it's certainly an integral part of how we can change and address this uh, global food systems transformation that is so urgently needed. Uh, thanks for your response. I think uh, we can uh, hear you loud and clearly, I, and I also hope Tom have uh, Tom had been <laughs> satisfied with the response. And uh, again, thanks for joining the session. And I really hope we can uh, have time to gather and have the in-person meeting next time. Maybe also in China sometime. Uh, and let's move to the next session. Thank you all. Thanks. <laughs>